Hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Costantini. I am currently an assistant professor in the Biological and Biomedical Sciences Department at North Carolina Central University. Today I'll be discussing some of my research involving visualizing viral replication of oncogenic human herpes viruses. But before I get into the science, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about my experiences and what have led me to develop a research program that investigates these oncogenic viruses. So my doctoral work was conducted at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I primarily did cell biology-based studies and utilized a lot of live cell fluorescence microscopy techniques. I then went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. There, I moved more into the field of virology and also um, increased my abilities in microscopy into electron microscopy. And now today in my lab at NC Central, I combine these um, interests in cell and molecular biology to study the cell and molecular biology of oncogenic viruses. So for the purpose of today's talk, I'm gonna focus on two major areas. The first being just an introduction into oncogenic herpes virus DNA replication. Um, our goal is to be able to characterize the KSHV or the Carposi sarcoma herpes virus DNA replication proteins and how they interact with viral DNA as well as protein-protein interactions. Um, we also hope to investigate how um, different cellular proteins that are normally involved in the DNA replication processes or transcriptional processes also may interact with some of these viral proteins in infected cells. And we primarily do this using a high resolution electron microscopy based approach. And this allows us to directly visualize purified proteins and purified nucleic acids. And we use transmission electron microscopy along with specialized sample preparation techniques that I will highlight throughout the, tech, throughout the talk for the, um, the different electron micrographs that are featured. So in general, viral infections are estimated to cause between 15 to 20% of human cancers. Listed in this um, table here are a breakdown of DNA viruses as well as RNA viruses that are recognized by the WHO to be etiologically responsible for certain human cancers. I'm primarily interested in the family of herpes viruses, specifically Carposi sarcoma herpes associated herpes virus, which is also known as herpes virus 8. A closely related vir um, herpes virus is Epstein-Barr, which is more commonly known. Um, it's more prevalent in populations. But there are other families of viruses that also contain viruses that are known to associate with um, causing different human cancers, and they're also listed here. In terms of human herpes viruses, there are already eight identified. Uh, KSHV happens to be the most recently identified human herpes virus. They're broken down into about three different, uh, into three categories, the alpha, beta, and gamma subfamilies. And herpes simplex, the alpha versions, um, are probably more commonly known herpes viruses, so like um, her the viruses that are associated with herpes simplex, as well as the virus that's called, um, associated with chickenpox or the varicella zoster virus. Those are examples of alpha herpes viruses. Um, beta, the, probably the most well-known or um, more commonly known is the cytomegalovirus, um, CMV. And then in terms of gamma viruses, which is really where our focus and my lab focus it examines is the gamma family um, herpes viruses. And that, like I said before, includes KSHV as well as Epstein-Barr. So in terms of infection, once uh, KSHV infects um, a host, it's primarily going to infect um, endothelial, epithelial, and B cells. Those are the primary cell tropisms. And in patients who are um, immunocompromised, the likelihood of potentially um, developing KSHV-associated cancers is much greater. And those associated cancers are known to be Carposi sarcoma, abbreviated KS, or uh, primary effusion lymphoma and multicentric Castleman's disease, and both of these two other cancers are um, associated with B-cell um, proliferative cancers. And like all herpes viruses, once you are infected with KSHV, it's a lifelong infection. And this is true for all of the herpes viruses that I mentioned on the previous slide. And this brings us to where we're focusing on is understanding that life cycle. Since it is a lifelong infection, we want to understand the phases and how the virus and cell um, coexist and how the viral um, infection remains persistent. So in general, uh, herpes viruses have a, basically a biphasic life cycle. So after primary infection, the virus is going to establish uh, latency or dormancy in primarily B cells in the human body. And this, during this latency phase, the virus is able to maintain its viral genome. And then during certain phases of 
one's life or the infected individual's life, there is reactivation. And reactivation is that transition from the dormant phase back into the active phase. And the active phase or the lytic phase is when new virus particles are produced. And in order for that to happen, you have to have four major steps that are occurring, right? So the viral proteins need to be produced. The viral genome needs to be replicated. These two components need to assemble into new viruses. And then eventually the new infectious virions need to be released from the infected cell to then spread to um, other, cell, other cells to then propagate and insert, ensure that persistent infection. The key step of the lytic viral replication phase is what we're interested in studying is that viral DNA replication part. So within that, there are key components that we've identified that are required and necessary. So on the KSHB genome, there are multiple lytic origins of replication. Um, two are denoted as OIR, OIR lytic L and R, and that just denotes a left and right origin, and we'll get more into that in some follow-up slides. In addition to the region of DNA that acts as the origin or the initiation site for where viral DNA replication begins are a host of DNA replication proteins. And KSHB has been identified to have seven required DNA replication proteins, and they're listed here. And it has been shown in the literature that these um, are necessary and essential for KSH for the KSHB genome to essential um, to effectively replicate during the lytic phase. So sh shown here is just a little bit more of a focus on the KSHB genome. So the genome um, is a large double-stranded genome. It's between 165 and 175 kilobases. As you can see by the cartoon representation below in this bar graph, this shaded colored different bar graph. I've also highlighted the approximate location of the two origins. And you can see the left and the right are on opposite, end, opposite ends of the genome. In the actual virions, in the infectious virus particles, the uh, KSHV genome is linear, double-stranded DNA. However, when the virus transitions in infected cells to the latent phase, the, vi uh, the viral genome goes through a um, restructuring and becomes a circular conformation. And that has to do with um, ensuring that the viral um, genome is able to be maintained in these latent or dormant infections. Um, and shown here is the first of many electron micrographs that I'll be sharing with you today. This is an example of a method that allows us to visualize DNA. And so what you can see in this image is you can see the white spaghetti-like spaghetti, sp spaghetti structures distributed across the entire EM grid. And then you can see white punctate structures um, in sporadic patterns. So those white punctate sp um, structures that are a little bit more 3D and raised off of the EM grid, those actually are um, the remnants of a KSHV virion. And what we've done is we've artificially disrupted the virus to basically allow the DNA to extrude out. And what you're seeing here is all those spaghetti-like structures are in fact the viral, gen viral genome um, mounted onto the surface of an electron, an electron microscope um, grid. So as I've mentioned already, we are interested in the viral proteins and the viral DNA that come together that allow the um, viral genome to be replicated. But in order to be able to do these types of studies, we need to have all of the, all of the DNA and protein together in order to com um, combine them and allow us to do these high resolution molecular studies. So we have a system that we're developing that will allow us to um, subclone and express our viral proteins of interest in a mammalian expression system, which we can then can purify the viral proteins from. Traditionally, um, most viral purification can be done from bacteria or insect cells, but we're hoping to really move into a more mammalian system that will allow us to ensure um, a high level of um, protein activity. In addition, we have a system already in place that allows us to subclone and um, our DNAs of interest into vector backbones, and that will allow us to amplify and then isolate known sequences and known sizes of DNA um, with high regularity. So overall, our big question is, how do the KSHB DNA replication proteins organize on this viral origin DNA? And so this is just, again, a cartoon schematic of an overall, the linear double-stranded genome, and now we're just going to focus in on how some of these proteins interact with the origin of replication DNA. So I've just shown a cartoon representation here of the five viral um, DNA replication proteins that we already have in our lab. And we also possess both of the lytic origin DNA sequences that we can regularly clone and digest and then um, utilize in our studies. 
So our big question is, can we visualize DNA going from the closed conformation to the open conformation? In addition, can we also examine where do the D, where on the DNA do the proteins of interest bind? How might these proteins interact with other DNA and other proteins? And is there a way that we can figure out the order in which the proteins assemble on this pre-initiation complex? The ultimate goal would be is if we can identify novel activities of the KSHV or herpes virus DNA replication proteins that are unique from our own DNA replication machinery, we can then use those unique activities or binding, um, binding confirmations and all of those types of information that we infer to identify novel replication inhibitor targets that can specifically inhibit those activities while um, leaving the cellular machinery um, non-changed. Um, non so in general, to create an in vitro KSHV DNA replication system, we utilize specialized electron microscopy to visualize the purified KSHV core DNA proteins, as well as DNA and protein complexes. Um, we began work on the four proteins listed here, which includes an origin binding protein, a processivity factor, a polymerase, and a single stranded binding protein. But today, I will be focusing on some of the work that we've been able to accomplish looking at the origin binding protein, or 50, also known as RTA, as well as some conformational studies where we've been beginning to examine how OR59, which is the processivity factor, assembles in vitro. So just to give a little bit more detail, so again, using TEM, we can look at protein DNA interactions. In addition to that, we can actually map protein binding sites, and we can map the locations as well as frequencies. And this is a unique approach because we already know the sequence of the origin sequences, and therefore we can then correlate position based on electron micrographs with location, and I will focus a little bit on some subsequent slides about that. In addition, one of the major advantages that we um, identified using TEM is that we are able to better assess heterogeneous populations and structures. So using more population-based approaches where you take an average or you might do a gel-based approach, which allows you to look at what is the most prominent species or interaction or binding site, our methods really do allow us to look at the single cell level and really identify majority and minority um, different heter um, heterogeneous complexes. Just to give a little bit more background into EM, we can use multiple um, sampling approaches our sample preparations. So you can use thin sectioning using an ultra microtome, which if you look at panels A and B, that's an example. So these are KSHV infected cells that we have um, thin sectioned and used TEM to examine. And what you can see in A is you can get a nice um, ultra structure of an entire cell. This happens to be, be a B cell um, latently infected with KSHV. In panel B, it's a bit zoomed in, and this is actually the nucleus of an infected cell. And what we can see are these um, viral replication centers that are forming, and those are those punctate structures. Um, in addition to that, some of the methods that um, were piloted in my postdoctoral lab, we can apply to look at protein DNA interactions, and that includes metal shadow casting. So if you go all the way to the other side of the spectrum to the nanometer scale in panel G and H, you can see individual proteins or individual proteins binding to DNA. And the contrast that metal shadow casting provides really allows us to see this in-depth molecular detail at the nanometer scale. In addition, we also use a pretty standard electron microscopy approach called negative staining, and that allows us to visualize proteins, viruses, and vesicles. And some representative examples are shown in panel E and F. And again, I'm using a transmission electron microscope and I'm using um, a digital camera to capture my images. So back to how we visualize the regions of DNA that we're interested in. Again, these are some representative EM micrographs. This is using a tungsten rotary shadow casting approach. This is looking at the right origin, which is approximately a 2.4 KB piece of DNA. On the left side of your screen, labeled KSHV origin DNA, we have just mounted the digested fragments of the origin, the right origin, and mounted them onto an EM grid. The background is that dark color. The white spaghetti-like structures that are on the surface are the actual DNA molecules. And you can see they, um, they will be mounted onto the grid and they sometimes have more of an elongated shape, sometimes they form loops. And so all of that allows us to see how potentially differences in DNA structure that can arise when we look at different DNA uh, protein interactions.
In addition, because we want to have a quantitative approach, we can also preferentially label, since we again know the sequence, we can use a schematic where we, or an approach where we use a biotin labeled DNTP that will preferentially only label one end of the origin sequence that we are interested in looking at. Then we can come in and add streptavidin, which will preferentially bind. And what you can see on the right-hand side of your slide is an example of what um, a labeled um, origin DNA replicate, uh, origin DNA will look like, in which case the arrows are denoting the streptavidin, which would be bound to the CTP that is integrated into our origin DNA. So with that, that allows us to have directionality, and I will show you how that matters when we get into the um, analysis where we're looking at binding site frequency and location. So a little bit more background about the first protein that I'm going to talk about today, and that's OR50. So again, we're interested in understanding how OR50 and um, the origin come together and interact. In general, OR50 is it's known it's uh, to bind to the lytic origin of replication. It's also known to interact with OR59, which is the polymerase processivity factor. It's shown to be essential for viral replication. It is known to recruit the entire DNA replication protein complex, key to initiating viral DNA replication, and it also has a role in initiating different um, lytic gene expression. So on the right side of your screen, you can see another representative electron micrograph image in which we have both OR50 and um, the origin, the right origin. We've done an in vitro binding assay, and then we've gone through the steps of mounting the DNA and protein complexes on a grid and use the tungsten rotary shadow casting method to visualize or provide additional contrast. Again, the background is going to be dark, and then you can see white globular structures um, dotted around the entire um, background. Those are proteins not bound to DNA. And then what you can see in the middle right side of the screen, you can see just a DNA molecule with no proteins bound. And then you can denote where the arrows are indicating. That would be a location where OR50 has been shown to be bound to the origin DNA sequence. So like I said, we want to be able to quantify this and we can our goal is to be able to measure frequency and map positions. Traditionally, a chip-seq type approach or a similar comparable approach could be used to ascertain this type of information. However, those um, might not be as sensitive to um, locations that are maybe less frequent than others. And so what we can do, again, we have our schematic that will allow us, our protocol that allows us to preferentially bind one of our ends of our origin, in this case, the right origin, with biotin. Then we come in and we label with streptavidin. We then do our binding assay with our DNA and protein of interest. And then we take hundreds of electron micrographs, and then we quantify that. So what we can do is then we can use our software, and we can trace and identify the length of the DNA. So we can take full length, denoted by this gray over um, overlay. Then we can go back and we can measure the distance between the streptavidin and the protein of interest, in this case, OR50. We can also measure the distance between the OR50 and the unlabeled end of DNA. We can also measure the distance between the streptavidin to the far end of the protein, as well as the far end of the protein to the unlabeled end of origin of the um, lytic DNA, that the lytic origin that we're looking at. And together that we can do um, a correlation with the sequence and we can convert our nanometer measurements to the base pair sequence of the lytic origin. And we can identify where on the origin that protein is bound. So this is just a represent example of one uh, mapping one of these sites. And if we map the position of this OR50 molecule on this molecule of DNA, it correlates to about a position 1900 base pair within the left, um, the right origin, that piece of DNA that we're looking at. So we can do this many times and we can quantify hundreds of different molecules. And what we can then do is we can map the frequency. So shown on the bottom of this panel, you see a gray bar with green, purple, and blue highlighted regions. The purple regions um, map to um, predicted or, um, or 50 binding sites. The green um, A um, region maps to previously published known binding sites um, that were identified using more traditional approaches. And the parts that are highlighted B and C are the regions that we have identified using our approach that seem to have high frequency of binding within those regions. And you can again see the frequency and frequency, high rate of frequency correlates with a higher bar. Um, and so from these types of methods, we're able to really examine 
difference um, where the protein is binding and then whether or not we see higher prevalence in certain locations. We can apply the same method to look at cellular transcription factors. So there are predicted um, consensus CFOS and CJUN sites within the origin right and left sequences. And what we can now do is, as a proof of principle, we can incubate purified CFOS and CJUN with our origin DNA that has three predicted um, consensus sites. And those, again, are highlighted with those purple regions. The purple regions map to where, we, um, where the sequence would be located on the piece of DNA. The blue bars that I've highlighted really just highlight the highest percent of frequency for that region that correlates with our analysis. So again, the electron micro micrograph on the left shows you the DNA structure as well as the um, globular protein bound to it. And what we hopefully, um, you can agree with us and see that the highest frequency is at those predicted sites and this CFOS, CJUN consensus sequence are extremely well studied and well characterized. So we feel that this is another proof of principle that will allow us to then um, extend our approach to look at multiple viral proteins and how they inter interact with viral DNA. Another advantage to our approach is not only can we do positional information and in looking at the heterogeneity of binding, but we can also look at how that um, protein, the conformation. So as shown here, these are just two representative micrographs that are just showing again, OR50 bound to different um, origin DNA sequences. And what you can see if you just look by eye is that there might be some size difference between the globular proteins associated with the DNA on the left panel versus the um, or 50 molecules associated in the right panel. And so for our approach, we can actually use standard um, proteins, standard globular proteins. So things like conalbumin and alcohol dehydrogenase have a very standard globular shape, and we know their molecular weight, so we can use those to compare to the proteins of interest. So OR50 has a molecular predicted molecular weight of 75 kilodaltons, which will be um, comparable to a conalbumin molecule. In addition, alcohol dehydrogenase would be more correlated with a dimer, which is about 150 kilodaltons in size. So on the top panels, you can see the OR50 molecules bound to the DNA. In the bottom panels, on the left-hand side, you'll see just conalbumin examined during using electron microscopy. And so you can see these white globular dots associated um, all throughout the grid and we can quantify those and take the areas of those. And then on the right side, you can see the same type of electron micrograph with alcohol dehydrogenase. Along the, back, um, the background, which is that dark color, you can see these white punctate structures that um, are the alcohol dehydrogenase protein. So we can then capture a bunch of electron micrographs and we can then quantify the area of each of these molecules. So the ones that we know to be fairly regular and globular versus what we want to understand of whether or not the OR50 molecule binds as a monomer or a dimer. So from this analysis, we can see, and you can see the spread of all the molecules that we um, quantify. We've quantified streptavidin, conalbumin, which would be most likely an OR50 monomer, alcohol dehydrogenase, which would correlate with an OR50 dimer. You can see the spread of the different OR50 molecules bind, bound to the left origin DNA actually more correlate strongly with the alcohol dehydrogenase. So this is a quantification. When we look by eye, that is also correlated that the size comparison is more like the size of an alcohol dehydrogenase protein compared to the um, conalbumin. We can also apply the same technique to cellular proteins. And we also have a truncated version of the OR50 molecule. And we can clearly show that with the smaller protein, we can actually quantify that difference um, and present it as an average area. So overall, I've hopefully um, given you a little bit of insight into our approach and the strength of our approach. We've been able to identify not only the OR50 predicted binding sites, but we believe that we've identified some novel binding sites. We believe that the OR50 protein binds primarily as a dimer. Um, and then we believe that potentially these multiple binding sites that we're able to identify could have potential um, could be um, important in understanding the different functions of OR50, whether it's the transcriptional functions or the replication protein functions. Um, in addition, we hope to understand more about how the OR50 dimerization might help to promote um, recruitment of these other proteins uh, that are required for the DNA replication. 
So I have a few more um, representative data that will talk about the OR50 or the processivity complex and some of the initial analysis we've done doing this. So in this um, example, you have an electron micrograph, a representative electron micrograph of OR50 alone. So this is just the protein. And this is examined using negative staining. And what you can see on the micrograph on the left-hand side of your screen is there's a couple different structures. On the top, you see three string Th um, three ring-like structures, and those are denoted by the arrowheads. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see more of a petal-like or maybe four individual proteins that are coming together to form a complex. And in the lower left-hand corner, you can see an arrow that's denoting a potential um, OR59 monomer. So in terms of the functionality of OR50, it's known to bind to our origin DNA. It's also known to interact with ORF9, which is the polymerase, which this is a processivity factor, so that makes complete sense in that. And then in addition, we know that it also has a role in combined with ORF50. So we, so that's already previously known. So now later, when we after we do these individual, individual characterizations, we can then move on to look at combinations of proteins using our approaches. It is also known that there's a predicted dimerization domain. So if we just examine OR50 using traditional methods, um, we can use native gels. And what we can use is we can use BSA as a size comparison. It's a relatively similar um, size estimate for monomers, dimers, et cetera. And so what we can see is that we can identify bands that would correlate with the or predicted OR59 monomer, potentially dimer, and then we can see a large band that most likely correlates to an OR50 hexamer, which would be six of the proteins coming together. Um, and that nicely correlates with the BSA ladder that we're using as um, a protein comparison. However, this doesn't account for the fact in that last slide with the EM micrograph, I was able to show you that we see two different conformations. And so we can see what we believe to be these more like petal-like structures, which are like, look to be composed of four individual monomers coming together to form a complex. In addition, we can see more of these ring-like structures where the individual proteins are less defined. We can then apply different quantifications and measurements so we can actually measure the entire diameter of the complex to have an idea of what the um, overall dimensions are. We can also examine the dimensions of the internal pore. So it looks like there's a dark center um, presumably, um, if it is a processivity factor that potentially binds as a clamp type mechanism, you would, you would assume that there would be some sort of DNA threading. And so we were able to quantify this using our EM techniques and we were able to identify what that um, diameter could be. So using these approaches, um, we were able to identify some novel um, protein conformations. So OR59 the observations that we have are consistent with the homologous EBV protein, which is known to be oligomeric. Um, we believe that it's forming these head-to-tail dimers, um, and they can be into tetrameric or hexameric structures. And based on our measurements, we understand that the central pore would be um, wide enough or large enough to accommodate a double-stranded DNA duplex, which has a diameter of roughly 2 nanometers. So we believe that the OR59, based on our preliminary studies, is functioning as a sliding clamp, which is consistent with some of the other predicted um, structures from other herpes viruses, but there is no overall consensus, and we're really hoping that some of our uh, high-resolution approaches um, will allow us to um, investigate that further. So again, I just want to um, round out the seminar today with just reiterating some of the advantage of directly visualizing um, proteins and DNAs. Um, using EM, we can see heterogeneous complexes, we can assess the oligomeric state and DNA architecture. I didn't show you today in our presentation, but for instance, sometimes different DNA protein, different DNA protein interactions will induce um, loop formations or um, replication bubbles, which again, we can all see using these techniques and specialized staining approaches. And not only can we take these images, but then we can take it a step further and quantify the data in terms of identifying position, um, DNA position mapping, as well as looking at molecular comparisons to understand what type of oligo or oligomer we're looking at. So in general, our future goals would be to really understand how this herpes DNA replication pre-initiation complex forms. So based on some of the data I presented and some of the other data that I wasn't able to share with you today, we believe that OR50 will initiate binding as a dimer. This will likely allow um, some sort of DNA um, distortion or unwinding at the origin, which will promote potentially the single-stranded binding protein to um, bind to the open 
um, origin. In addition, we know that ORP50 or RTA has the capacity to interact with the processivity factor or ORP59. So we predict that this will now allow for interaction between the ORP50 molecule with the pro processivity factor. And then that will allow the recruitment of the DNA polymerase to then allow the initiation complex to ensue. So just with that, um, Again, my focus is really understanding the viral DNA replication. Our lab also has projects that also investigate how cellular stress influences viral reactivation. And based on some of our techniques that I've highlighted, we are also um, eager to con conduct collaborative projects that think that would have, um, that would learn something or gain some insights based on some of our approaches. So lastly, I just want to acknowledge those who have um, aided in allowing me to get to where I am today. Um, researchers and lab members and collaborators at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, as well as those individuals at the University of North Carolina, as well as the members of my lab here and some current collaborators. So thank you, and I look forward to receiving questions um, in the follow-up sessions.